Okay, well, welcome. So today we have Professor Nihar Kumar. She's uh, in the College of Computing and has a joint appointment also with International Affairs, right? Not anymore. Not anymore? Okay. Also not an assistant professor anymore. Uh, yeah, no. I said <laughs> 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 did you yeah. get promoted last recent? Three years ago. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so no, not that recent. I made a boo-boo. <laughs> oh, you made a boo-boo. Oh, okay. On the, on the, on the invitation. On the invitation. Yeah, yeah. So you um, are not the... No, I actually I moved to the School of Interactive Computing. Interactive yeah, okay. yeah, okay. so I did, yeah. Well, so. Um, um, international affairs loss, I guess, in that case. <laughs> Still doing work in the space of global development, so, yeah. Yeah, so um, her work is at the intersection of human-computer interaction and global sustainable development. And today is a very thought-provoking topic, post-growth um, ideas. So. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And Vishal is uh, the first author on the paper that I am presenting today. So I just want to do a quick intro. Uh, so um, uh, Vishal is a BBISS graduate fellow in his second year, just finishing up his second year. Just proposed his dissertation and will be wrapping up in about a year. And uh, actually planning to defend in exactly one year, minus one day. And, uh, and so um, the reason I chose this paper also is because, um, because he's here, and I thought it could be a good um, uh, exercise to, to do this as a research talk, but also to do it as a conversation. And we'll see what that looks like, because this is, I mean, I do have content in there t so that it looks like a talk, but to the extent that we can actually have a conversation, I think it would be nice. So um, if there are folks online who would like to at any point unmute and ask any questions or contribute to the conversation, you're absolutely welcome to. So with that, I'll go ahead and, um, and get started. Um, so firstly, thank you for, for having me. Uh, and uh, I want to start with defining care. So care is um, what this talk is about at, at a high level, and care is also the topic that has been at the core of most of uh, what my lab here at Georgia Tech has been doing. And this is the, uh, the tandem lab, um, which includes Vishal, includes a few other uh, students who've been looking at various aspects of care. Um, on the care economy, uh, care giving, care work, and such. So uh, this talk, in some ways, is also about uh, care and the work that it takes. And um, as as you listen, I hope that you'll also find uh, your uh, your minds making connections with the research topics, the people, the methods, the worlds that you care about and that have taught you about care. So Fisher and Toronto define care in these terms. It is a species activity uh, that includes everything that we do to maintain, continue, and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves, and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web. And I'll talk today about care at the planetary level, so not only looking at our uh, immediate surroundings, but also thinking about um, the collective and the planet as a whole. Uh, I want to mention that these are some of the people who have taught me most of what I know today in my scholarship about care. These are current and former students who have journeyed through the Tandem Lab and engaged on topics related to care and care work. And um, I'm always drawing on the endless conversations that we've had in our lab meetings, in our group chats, and with the papers that we've written through the years. And uh, this includes conversations about research, about people, about life on this planet. Um, a quick uh, Can word. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. When you put the first line and there was the heart and the two hands, suddenly I felt like my body relax and my shoulders come down. <laughs> it's so powerful, I think. It's, uh, yeah. It's caring and seeing it visually. How nice yeah. to hear that. Um, it's good that <laughs> somebody's working on care as opposed to just running, running, running. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually, uh, yeah, and many people in, in the room, and Karthik just defended his thesis yesterday, also looking at, at care work. So um, that's, yeah, that's great to hear. 
Uh, I'm going to hold on to that. Uh, so, um, so a quick word about my positionality, who I am, and how that plays into my role as an HCI worker. And HCI might be um, a new term for some people in the room. So uh, it is human-computer interaction, and it's the space in which I do um, work and my students do work. So, uh, you know, I, I lived in three continents growing up, uh, first in India, um, and then moved to Germany as a teenager where I went to high school, and then I moved to the US where I went to school at UC Berkeley and then Stanford University. And here I was trained in computer science and math and education and also deeply involved in nonprofit work. And I worked at Microsoft then on the PowerPoint team. And since then, I have not used PowerPoint for my presentations. I always use Keynote. Uh, and um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I just don't have a good feeling when I work on, on, on PowerPoint anymore. I guess it all, always feels like there's so much going on, which is what was my experience when I was working on it, that there's all this stuff going on. But anyway, not to detract from the topic at hand. So. Um, my backgrounds, cultural, regional, and institutional, have all in some shape or form contributed to what I'm doing today, which in large part is focused towards infrastructure and care. So in research and teaching and service, where access to care is in straightforward, and there are struggles around power at individual, institutional, and ecological levels, and enabling care um, is at its core about restoring dignity. Um, so a quick word about just where I come from. So I'm committed to worlds that are globally diverse, inclusive, and equitable, to a world within the field of human-computer interaction that recognizes and honors knowledge that comes from different corners of the world, uh, which is from and about individuals and communities from uh, differently diverse backgrounds and perspectives, and with the acknowledgment that this can all get a bit misguided and saviorous when we're not careful. So this awareness is shaped by my reading of scholars such as Chandra Mohanty, who helped me recognize how I'm simultaneously situated in the Western and the so-called third world. And this bit from her resonates with me in particular. So she says in her book uh, called Feminism Without Borders that I'm clearly located within the one third world. Then again, I straddle both categories. I'm off the two thirds world in the one third world. And, and what she's trying to do here is you know, not, not, use, not rely on terms like the global north and the global south, which are very kind of regionally defined, but really say that we have um, margins everywhere. And so the two thirds world is really the the world that is the majority world and the one-third world is what she refers to as a minority with all of its privileges. Um, but her political choices, struggles, and vision for change place her alongside the two-thirds world. So I would say I am for the two-thirds world, but with the privileges of the one-third world, I speak as a person situated in the one-third world, but from the space and vision of and in solidarity with communities and struggle in the two-thirds world. Um, and yeah, these. I, I'm sorry, I missed the context. What does one third world and two thirds world mean? So, uh, you know, the, the terms global north and south are seen as a little bit problematic in that they are, um, you know, they're basically creating a regional divide, right? Uh, which is very much uh, bound by, the, like, whether you call it hemispheres or you call them, you know, but, but physical space. And what she says is that the kinds of problems that you see in the global south are not specific to the global south alone, but you also see them in other parts of the world. So instead of saying that this is the geography where these problems persist, um, to recognize that they persist everywhere, uh, so, and it is the majority world or the two thirds of, of the entire world where you will see them. But uh, when we're speaking from a place of privilege or, 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 you know, what we think about when we think of the global north, that is what she refers to as a one third world. Uh, and so it's. The notion that even, say, I mean, the US is part of the global north, but there is a lot of um, poverty and inequity mm -hmm. yeah. and so on here in the US and the problems yeah. of the two world and meshed with the one-third world at the, in the same geography. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so basically the metaphorical south rather than the geographical. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and, um, and, and to me the message here is really that 
we need to be an acknowledgement of the fact that we're always occupying in any room, in any space, occupying positions of less and more privilege. And this places on us the necessary burden of always having to adapt and situate ourselves. And this also takes care. So looking at uh, sustainability growth and in the context of HCI. So this is the focus of today's conversation, sustainability and growth in HCI, but really a conversation about planetary care and how we infrastructure this care in our individual, our collective, institutional, and ecological existence. So HCI as a field likes sustainability. It implicitly likes the idea of reducing overproduction and overconsumption and moving beyond the dominant economy that seeks incessant economic growth. But the advancement of this field itself, at least as the field has developed thus far, relies significantly on continued economic growth to scale technology, reach new users and geographies, to fit more processing power into smaller hardware, right? So almost all improvements and in user interactions that we think about consume additional energy and resources. For example, on-demand streaming platforms such as YouTube and Netflix might consume up to 200 terawatt hours annually, which is more power than some countries consume in a year. Training a single NLP model may emit more than 600,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent to about what, what five cars produce during their useful life. This is all the math that Vishal has done for our paper together, so I just want to be clear. Um, and also, it's not just HCI. Like computing as a discipline itself is premised on continued growth, right? So foundational ideas such as Moore's Law uh, of doubling the number of transistors in integrated circuits every two years, or Nielsen's Law of doubling internet bandwidth every 21 months, all of these endorse growth. So um, if we look at HCI researchers, they have begun to critique growth from a sustainability perspective. For example, Borning and colleagues note that the IT industry has linked itself strongly to this ethos of growth with some particular manifestations being the constant need for novelty, the accompanying throwaway culture around consumer electronics, and the glorification of disruption for its own sake. Yet growth that requires ever more material resources, he says, cannot continue forever in a finite world. No, uh, then Knowles and, and colleagues suggest designing technologies relying less on instrumental purposes of efficiency connected with corporate profit, motivated by research paradigms grounded in the belief of infinite economic growth, and relying more on volitional and value-laden aspects of underlying people's use of technologies, right? So, um, we're here in this paper trying to propose a shift to beyond growth politics in and through the field of HCI to address contributions to economic growth that are responsible for exacerbating the poly crisis of climate change, pandemics, socioeconomic inequalities, geopolitical instabilities, environmental devastation, and more. But before we go further, it would be good to touch on what post-growth actually is. So post-growth entails theorization and application of ideas from degrowth and post-development to achieve a global steady-state economy. And I'll go over these terms briefly. So degrowth considers the economic overkill in the global north a damaging trend that must be stopped. Post-development proposes alternatives to development in the global south. And this really came up as a response to the harm that was being done in the name of development back in the 90s. And these are alternatives that are not rooted in centralized industri industrial growth, but centered on localized development, leveraging local resources and knowledge. Then a steady state economy seeks equilibrium between population growth and production by maintaining a constant rate of material throughput. And if we think about post-growth, it's an asset-based paradigm that seeks to transform production and consumption so that they're ecologically sustainable in the long term and support a good life for all. And to redesign infrastructures, to redesign institutions, to become independent from this continuous capitalist expansion. It suggests that, for example, the uh, GDP is not the best metric as it only measures the value of final goods and services or the rate at which nature and human activities are transformed into monetary outcomes. So post-growth advocates uh, assessment of health, biodiversity, social progress, spiritual progress, and well-being of all humans and non-humans. So leveraging this idea of post-growth, what we're trying to do in this work is to uh, seek to cultivate a critical consciousness about the economy's increasing influences 
uh, in Paulo Freire's sense of generating critical consciousness to perceive the social, political, and economic forces that influence human lives. So um, what's in this paper and that QR code basically directs us to the um, the full paper, we lay out the consequences of economic growth to shed light on the problems of the current economy and to make a case for seeking alternatives. And we discuss issues around sustainability within growth, followed by discussions that problematize and challenge uh, HCI's engagement as a field with economic growth. We then introduce post-growth philosophy. We describe its emergence, its definition, core ideas and stances on technology. And we present what that could mean within the field of computing, within human-computer interaction in particular, discussing ideas and systems aligned with post-growth. And then we offer recommendations for the field to adopt a post-growth orientation, to develop economic literacy, to mediate policy making, to evaluate the political economy, to normalize, redesign, and undesign, to nurture solidarity, recognize limits, and cultivate critical pedagogy. So I'll go over those when we get to it a little bit later. So in this paper, we're inviting everyone to draw on these recommendations through our work to critique them so that with such reflection, we can take a step toward raising critical consciousness in this realm. So this is really about starting a conversation and about engaging others in this conversation to see how uh, could we engage in uh, post-growth philosophy to study, design, and develop technologies that are liberated from the growth paradigm so we can work together towards a sustainable, a just, a humane, we can use many more descriptors along those lines, post-growth society mediated by the technologies that we design. So what does growth do? Um, since the close of the Second World War in 1945, the philosophy of growth has dominated virtually all economies and most economic discourse. Economists typically assume growth to be good. Sooner or later, they say economic growth will benefit all of humanity. However, there's rising evidence to suggest that growth is also the root cause of economic inequality and environmental devastation. Right On economic uh, inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor has dramatically increased worldwide. So in the 1980s, the richest 10% of the global population earned seven times more than the poorest 10%. And from 1999 to 2008, the richest 40% of the global population received 95% of the new income generated by economic growth. In 2012, the richest 10% earned 10 times more than the poorest 10%. And in 2020, the richest 0.5% owned more wealth than 90% of the global population. Mm -hmm. So um, Jason Hickel reported, the richest 1% alone captured $19 trillion in income every year, which represents nearly a quarter of global GDP. And uh, we're all familiar with the litany of environmental crises, but we do not always recognize them as outcomes of economic growth. Climate scientists have pointed for years to growth as a root cause of environmental devastation. So Ripple and colleagues said policies to alleviate the climate crisis or any of the other threatening planetary boundary transgressions should not be focused on symptom relief, but on addressing their root cause, which is the overexploitation of the earth through economic growth. And then according to the IPCC 2022 report, we must abandon the global high carbon consumption and GDP growth oriented economy to transition to a low carbon energy services, well-being and equity oriented economy. To try and direct HCI efforts to address environmental devastation, the subfield of sustainable HCI emerged around 2007 with people like Ellie Blevis and uh, Mankoff and colleagues recommending making sustainability a central focus of um, interaction design. Early work in this field looked at altering users' behavior, for example, via eco-feedback uh, systems or computer games. Critics argued against such a focus, saying that persuasive interventions overestimate an individual's capacity for action, and that merely changing users' practices is not enough when a more systemic change is needed. This has been a core tension in the field where there is a group of people looking at how individual behaviors can be shaped, but also a group of people really pushing hard on not looking at individual behaviors and looking more at systemic views. Uh, Gangelbauer uh, and colleagues noted that 
even the best designed and most well-intended persuasive technology application to foster sustainable behaviors cannot persuade users to engage in the desired behaviors if the circumstances are not allowing or supporting them. So although individuals are aware of environmental problems, they may have few options, such as public transportation, for example. They may not recognize sustainability as a priority, or they might become desensitized when faced with the enormity of the problem. Acknowledging sustainability as a bigger than self issue, sustainable HCI scholars advocated moving beyond persuasion. Paul Durish asserted that framing sustainability solely in terms of personal moral choice in a marketplace of consumption options may obscure the broader political and regulatory questions that attend significant change. And this is all basically to capture that there are these opposing viewpoints, and yet you know everyone is guided by these same values, which is around uh, becoming much more aware of the need to be more sustainable. Uh, sustainable HCI work has also uh, uh, begun to address broad scale policy reform and business practices. For example, uh, Knowles and colleagues suggested that solutions proposed by sustainable HCI can only succeed if they are coupled with political action toward affecting the supply of fossil fuels, including a combination of legislation of caps and taxes and or offering fossil fuel companies additional subsidies to keep their assets in the ground. So all of this to say, these recommendations all hold great value for us as, as researchers and as a field. And we're building on this work to address the role that is played by economic growth as HCI scholars, such as Bonnie Nardi, who's a um, advising author on this paper, Alan Borning, and many other, other colleagues have called for. Erickson and Fardwin argue that sustainable HCI largely misunderstood what the real problem is, and that we are inadvertently pushing with all our might in the wrong direction. So here are some examples that demonstrate that this is what is happening in the world of technology, right? If you look at just these examples, there's a rebound effect, which points to how technological advancements may increase the efficiency of resource use, but increased efficiency can paradoxically lead to an increase in resource consumption. For example, if you look at LEDs for outdoor lighting, they might decrease energy consumption and increase cost savings per unit, but they may also have the effect of increasing overall use as LEDs are now placed in areas that they were, that were formerly unlit or were lit for shorter periods. There are many other examples that we can think of, such as irrigation technologies, energy efficient vehicles and such. Plant obsolescence is the practice of in, intentionally manufacturing a product to have a short life. So we have frequent software upgrades, for example, which deliberately cause older models of devices to run slowly making the advice is inconvenient and even use, unusable. So if we think about Apple and Samsung release, um, uh, releasing software upgrades, these impact the working of older models of their products. Technologies are designed to prevent users from performing simple repairs, forcing them to move to new devices or rely on companies for repairs. Erecting barriers to repair, making repair expensive or tedious, means that users then end up buying new devices instead of making the most of older ones. Then there is perceived obsolescence, which is a type of planned obsolescence. And this is a practice of updating the styling of products to decrease the perceived desirability of older models. I mean, we see this with our computers, we see this with, um, uh, with phones, that there is a sense that we need to be uh, updating these, these tools uh, frequently, right? So the economy has transformed the relationship between workers and machinery. System, systematically moving labor to the margins and exploiting the user. Um, increased automation pushes workers to the background with their labor being poorly compensated or not being compensated at all. The worker and their work then disappear from view. Computation remains a visible output. And workers often find themselves performing repetitive tasks such as labeling thousands of hours of training data or reviewing harmful content, um, such as happens with you know, platforms like Facebook, for example. But arguably, it is not the worker, but the technology that is getting the credit. Social media users through online interactions such as tagging, sharing, liking, and commenting provide web-based businesses with a digital goldmine of personal data. And this is of immense value to insurance companies, healthcare providers, retail companies, manufacturers. Uh, this labor is naturalized as a part of what it means to be a user of a digital technology. So even tech-savvy users may not be totally aware of the full scope of data gathering and use. 
Uh, they don't know which data are gathered. They don't know how they are gathered, where and how long they are held, and with whom the data are shared. The economy uses digital technologies to exploit us in, in ways that are largely unknown to, to most, and only a few really know what's going on. So Bartman and Erickson know that while we obviously need to transition to a sustainable society, we don't really know what that means, and we have a hard time imagining what that implies. And in this paper, we draw on a vast body of literature across many different disciplines to discuss post-growth as an alternative. We describe post-growth's historical, cultural, and political emergence with the hope of enriching HCI research and practice. And then we discuss some of post-growth's core ideas for building a more sustainable, just, and humane society. Um, we don't have uh, enough time to go into all of the details of the paper, but um, let's see what we do have time for. So, uh, so what is post-growth? Post-growth does not propose a return to a primitive past or forced deprivation. It is about making more informed decisions. It's about a planned and intentional move away from economic growth. It's a progressive reorientation to more sustainable, empowering, and pleasurable living. These values are not part of uh, neoliberal market philosophy, nor have they been realized under neoliberalism. Post-growth involves decommodifying essential goods and services, curbing wealth and overconsumption so as to increase equality bet between and within societies. And it's seeking to expand public services and democratizing and localizing development with collective forms of meaningful social relationships, shared values and goals in place of material consumption, in place of market transact uh, transactions and exchange values. Um, so these are the, the ideas associated with post-growth, but it's also um, important to look at the history and the definition of it before we then come to the present and see how to uh, engage. So in, in 1972, Meadows and colleagues published the limits to growth presenting results from a series of computer simulations analyzing the long-term sustainability of the economy. They argue that if current growth rates were to continue, we would face a global economic collapse before 2100. And in, in his follow-up to this work, Andre Gortz pointed out, even at zero growth, the continued consumption of scarce resources will inevitably result in exhausting them completely. Uh, Daly in 1991 uh, proposed the idea of a steady state economy that seeks equilibrium between population growth and production by maintaining a constant rate of material throughput. Daly emphasized that growth should be considered a temporary state until stability is achieved, after which further growth is undesirable. And these ideas have also made their way into the Sustainable Development Goal Framework put forth by the UN. And uh, in our paper, we talk about how collectively steady state economy, uh, degrowth and post-development can support a post-growth society via radical shifts from growth to redistribution, production to reproduction and care, acquisition to sharing and community, industrial development to development that is appropriate to local circumstances and contexts. Um, to say that values cannot be focused on material accumulation, accumulation they must include solidarity, sufficiency, leisure, conviviality, sharing, and autonomy, among other things. The post-growth movement is still uh, growing and changing, and it is challenging to put post-growth in a box. Um, and, and, and so we wouldn't say that the ideas that we present in our paper are exhaustive, but we've tried to look comprehensively across the field of HCI to see how post-growth philosophies could be useful to think about computing interactions. So ideas of taking care of resources and providing care for others, including the planet, are deemed crucial to this movement. And here are some examples that align with uh, post-growth thinking. So the first core idea that we present is to define minimum and maximum standards of consumption that could align human well-being uh, within planetary limits. So minimum standards would allow everyone to live a good life, meeting basic needs, while maximum standards would limit overconsumption, especially by high consumption cultures and institutions. And these standards could be operationalized, for example, via a universal basic income and universal maximum wealth. So universal basic income would cover basic needs such as food, shelter, clothing, possibly in the form of a monthly stipend that is financed through tra uh, taxation. 
Uh, transitioning to a basic income could include a negative tax that would provide tax credits while more heavily taxing the wealthy. Universal maximum wealth would redistribute wealth accumulated by the rich to the poor, imposing increased wealth, inheritance, and property taxes. A wealth tax, for example, would set an absolute cap on wealth accumulation. An inheritance tax would set an upper limit on inherited assets. Property taxes would limit property owned, and some tax would be paid at the time of purchase. These standards could address economic insecurity and unemployment while supporting a decent living standard for all. Standards of consumption would not be defined by those in power, but through a democratic process of collective negotiation. Scholars whose work has uh, informed the development of post-growth philosophy all question how technology is imagined, for what purposes, and the conditions under which it is deployed. Some support technology as an agent for transitioning to a post-capitalist society. Gortz talks about the benefits of open source software, arguing that these tools support self-production instead of being controlled by private or state-supported powers, which deny human beings their ability to collectively decide their ways of living, producing, and consuming. Illich developed the, con the concept of convivial tools that nurture values of solidarity, mutual support, and friendship. He argues for the democratization of technology that everyone, irrespective of identity or technical abilities, should be able to use technology. A bicycle, for example, is considered a convivial tool because of the ease of understanding, repairing, and modifying it. The last time I gave this talk, though, people thought that a bicycle is actually not such a convivial tool. And I fear that some of those are actually, I don't think that my bike, for example, would be. But it's an interesting example to discuss. Uh, technological democratization could be supported by establishing institutions such as fab labs or makerspaces. A makerspace can offer a setting for, paper, for people to meet, socialize, and co-create, supporting cooperation, sharing, and care instead of competition. It can provide easy access to digital and non-digital technologies such as hardware, software, digital fabrications, art studios, and traditional crafts. For example, bike kitchens are non-commercial, shared, do-it-yourself maker spaces for repairing bikes. Local community members can recycle their bikes, making the parts available for others. They can help and learn from each other, building a culture of sharing knowledge, space, and tools with less dependence on capitalism. Maker spaces operate in the liminal zone, liminal zone between the monetized and non-monetized economies, supporting uh, non-capitalist relations. They support localization of production and consumption, sharing of resources, cultivation of non-capitalist exchange. Makerspaces can be linked through digital commons of design and knowledge, avoiding the commodific commodification of technologies. Others know that technology cannot be the only means to post growth. Socioeconomic transformation is also absolutely necessary. So Hickel emphasized that the debate is not primarily about technology, but about science, justice, and the structure of the economic system. Scholars have critiqued the idea that solutions to all problems such as hunger, poverty, ecosystem destruction, and climate change can be found in advanced technology. Complex social problems cannot be fixed through technological breakthroughs. Proposed technological saviors for sustainability include technologies for green growth, eco-innovation, and techno-science for sustainable growth. And according to these uh, approaches, technological improvements will decouple economic growth from environmental destruction so we can have sustainable growth. So if we equip people with the right technology to provide the right information about their energy consumption, their unsustainable behavior can be altered. However, absolute decoupling is not possible as these approaches take sustainability concerns as subordinate to economic growth. Decoupling would be possible only if growth rates approach zero, a distant prospect considering the, the current reality and increasing focus on unlimited growth. So how does post-growth translate into practical reimaginings of HCI? What should we do differently to lead the way to post-growth futures within HCI and within computing at large? We look at existing research to shed light on the answers to these questions. And, and, and those examples have really been helpful in illuminating how we could be like, what are some pathways to this, this type of a future? And even if the linkages are often implicit, we highlight the emergence of post-growth sensibilities within HCI. So I'll go over some of these efforts to achieve post-growth futures. 
Um, increasingly, we have seen an emphasis on values such as care, solidarity, plurality, and justice. Um, in prior work led by Vishal, we uh, uncovered the value of designing digital labor platforms to support values of mutual aid and reciprocity, which are central to economic work, but often made visible by neoliberal market mechanisms. We studied the digital work that novelists perform to produce and sell books online, noting how this work depends on cooperation and coordination rather than competition. Novelists in this case helped each other with digital advertisements and sales to, to collectively make sense of uh, algorithms that were often invisible and often precarious. They provided emotional support to each other. They were aware that they would receive help in return when needed. And we talked in this paper about how this cooperation challenges neoliberal discourses of individual success via a competition. It's a case in decoupling design from its modern industrialized roots so that it can be resituated and reconceptualized as a method, approach, mindset, and ontology grounded in respectful reciprocal relationships. Right. And, and there are many other examples where HCI researchers have been investigating values of reciprocity, decoloniality, autonomy, and, and uh, post-work. We uh, talked about the core idea of minimum and maximum standards of consumption. And along these lines, there's um, uh, solar.lowtechmagazine.com uh, was developed as a low-tech off-grid solar-powered website. And since 2018, the site has been operating as an experiment and design provocation to question the need and sustainability of economic growth and, and technology design. Based on principles derived from degrowth for guiding the design of web uh, environments that want to limit energy footprint, what the site does is it shuts down during rainy or cloudy weather and provides a weather forecast at the server's location to prepare users for the shutdown. Its intermittent availability is designed to raise user, users' awareness of the finiteness of resources. Uh, and then Kadir and colleagues created an approximate internet, which provides a good enough, a good enough um, networking service considering ecological limits. So when parameters such as performance, cost efficiency, energy, and coverage are in conflict, the approximate internet uses context appropriate trade-offs by selectively optimizing certain parameters that are based on local requirements. So it provides service intermittently, incorporating ideas from delay tolerant networking to reduce energy consumption. Right. Then there's the example of StreetNet, which is actually um, was part of the dissertation of a student that I previously co-advised here at, uh, at Tech, uh, who was really looking at how uh, people in Cuba were sharing information through this um, internet-like uh, knowledge network uh, when they had very limited use, uh, very limited access to uh, the internet. And all of these cases demonstrate a radical reimagining of digital technologies to support a post-growth society. If we think about it in terms of the uh, minimum and maximum standards of consumption, uh, we can support a localized, decentralized development of technologies. Um, and before building a working prototype, we can envision systems similar uh, to some of these to support uh, efforts to orient the HCI community and its work and practices towards post-growth thinking, right? So in all of these cases, we basically see examples where um, our expectations around technology are being challenged and, and there are uh, examples of, of other ways of sharing information or other ways of going online or other ways of relying on this constant connectivity, which um, helps us imagine you know, new, new ways of being. So how might we uh, draw on some of these examples that have uh, been established in, in prior work and embrace and formalize post-growth thinking in HCI? Uh, these are some recommendations to question the inevitability, neutrality, and desirability of growth so that when we look at our work and we look again, we can identify often hidden assumptions of growth and to deepen inquiry into non-capitalist ways of sensing, knowing, being in HCI. So in the interest of time, I will only cover a few and in the paper we talk about more uh, examples. So on developing economic literacy, HCI already has a practice of drawing from other disciplines, which helps us you know, helping us to better understand humans, computers, and their interactions. And there's also much for HCI to draw from economics to understand the political economy of computing. 
We cannot claim to understand sustainability without understanding costs to sustainability, and this needs both a micro and macroeconomic perspective. So this is something that we talk about in the paper, how we could really think about developing economic literacy though, so that people who are engaging with computing uh, can also look at the, uh, the economics of it. Uh, with regards to mediating policy making, so on the local level, post growth encourages small scale economies of self sufficiency. Uh, on the national scale, this could look like granting human rights, natural resources. On the global scale, we could be encouraging the re redistribution of resources and wealth. Uh, on the topic of evaluating the political economy, there has been increased awareness um, in our community around engaging with policy for real world impact. There's also a growing pressure to make one's research more relevant and useful in the real world. It's unclear, however, that HCI researchers and practitioners have the expertise that it takes to be successful at policy making. And so here we uh, point out that our efforts in design might support unjust politics, and we need to be careful to understand whether or not this is true. What is the impact of the work that we are doing? Also, quick technological fixes may not be enough, and we need to engage in design work that can unsettle and uproot systemic inequities. Um, so again, zooming out to keep asking bigger questions of ourselves and our work is, is non-trivial, but it's critical that we do this. Um, and also along the lines of normalizing undesign and redesign, there's many, many examples of research projects where we have found that technology sometimes have the opposite outcome that what was intended, right? And so we talk constantly about unintended consequences of design or uh, not being able to anticipate outcomes. And this is especially true when there are multiple stakeholders and not all perspectives have been factored in for, for any number of reasons. Uh, techn technological interventions are also known to cause harm and sometimes causing more harm than good. So we can choose not to design by valuing the implication not to design, especially in a field that often talks about the implications for design. And we can be open to redesigning as we become aware of consequences. We can also consider undesigning by investigating ways to prevent, to limit, or to erase technologies. So I won't go over these last three in detail, but very quickly, nurturing solidarity is about finding common ground, bringing people together. Recognizing limits is necessary if we are to operate within them. And cultivating critical pedagogy is important to ensure that we as learners and educators are working to bring a post-growth awareness and orientation across the discipline in our relative communities. So to conclude, we know that there are global crises in the making. There's increasing temperature, heat waves, wildfires, soil erosion, floods, drought, desertification, to name just a few, right? So inaction really isn't an option and we just need to decide what we will do next and when and how we will act. And Bartman and Erickson have argued that a precondition to finding good answers is to ask better questions and to help others ask better questions uh, and ask questions towards greater awareness instead of coming up with tired knee-jerk answers that have proved to be inadequate again and again. Uh, our hope through this paper is to do that, to ask better questions, to encourage us all to think carefully about what kinds of worlds we wish to create and inhabit, and, and also to ask better questions in line with those ideas. And with this proposal for a post-growth HCI, uh, our goal is really to invite our community and, and friends of our community to orient, embrace, reflect, learn, practice, critique uh, in ways that will help us as a scholar community and engage with, with practitioners as well uh, towards a planet uh, that, is, uh, that has practices that are more sustainable. So that is our hope uh, through this work. And with that, I will say, um, I want to thank um, you all for, for, for listening to this, and also I want to thank Vishal for his persistence. This is a paper that took him three and a half to four years to actually get out, and it's a, a lot of knowledge, a lot of discussions, a lot of engagement with different aspects of, you know, different, different um, strands of work across our community. So, um, uh, I'm excited to know just here with all of the people in the room and online, just um, how do these ideas resonate with you? What are the ways in which it connects with work that you've been doing, with that you've been thinking about? 
you know, how could we take these ideas forward? So thank you. Sure. Questions from uh, um, from our remote participants? Questions or comments? We normally start with online. There might be a question in the chat that we're checking. Two questions. In the scenario where a maximum wealth cap is implemented, how will incorruptibility of the state which will be responsible for redistributing the wealthy and insured. There's another one, but let's start there because that's a big question. Yeah, I mean that that's a that's really important. I think it also connects with the um, with the part about mediating policy making. Um, what are your thoughts, Vishal? I'm trying to read the question. In the scenario where a maximum wealth cap is implemented, how will incorruptibility of the state, which will be responsible for redistributing the wealth, be ensured? Yeah, I think one of the things is like, well, of what I remember from Postforth, it talks about, uh, you know, uh, that looking at state at a more national or international level, like however we, we want to define it, you have to make it more localized where local people are in charge of like the local politics and the policy making. So if that is done, if there is more agency for local people to participate in policy making or local economies, defining how, you know, what the maximum and minimum standards should be, in that case, some of these ideas can be, you know, or some of these problems can be circumvented or worked around. That is my understanding. But I'm wondering if you're audible. Is he going to be audible? Yeah, yeah. so okay. I'll, okay. I can I see. follow. Okay, okay, okay. okay great. Um, I mean, I would say that that even as things are now, there's there's still corruptibility, um, right? But yes, I think in, uh, introducing any of these uh, caps is going to uh, need work in terms of. Um, implementation. The, and the second question is sort of along similar lines, which is will technological innovations like LLMs, which would not have been possible without consuming a large amount of resources, and the usefulness or necessity of which is still not clear, cease to exist in a post-growth world? Would we have chat GPT in a post-growth world? In the paper, we say like these are some of the things that we need to decide if we have to undesign them or not, because they take a lot of energy and resources. So that as a <clears throat> that is something that collectively we need to decide. It should not be like one person's decision or somebody like a person in power or privilege decide, deciding that. So in I'm like based on my understanding, it should not be a part of a post-growth world or post-growth future, large language models, unless and until we entirely shift to a, you know, to a system where the energy consumption is based on totally uh, renewable resources. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Joe? Are you are you talking to me? Yes. Oh, well. It, that I actually had a, a question along those lines where I couldn't help but think about in the civil and environmental engineering world where we're often driven by te technological advancement, which eventually leads to this, this you know, insatiable appetite for growth. Uh, how do we operate across disciplines with engineers in particular to innovate where where we're not necessarily thinking about that that GDP increase or that that in efficiency increase that turns into a rebound effect, and now we're using you know more more net greenhouse gas emissions and things of that sort. So I guess my my question would be, how do we facilitate a cultural shift in in disciplines such as engineering, civil and environmental specifically, uh, utilizing this post growth degrowth concept, but still assuage some of the more traditional engineering uh, thrusts that have, you know, really cultured 
the discipline for so many years? I know that's a complex thing to answer, but just really curious around the, the ideas in that regard. Yeah, and I think there's also a question of the moving, moving away and moving toward, right? So uh, is, is, this, is this really a push for moving us towards certain values and philosophies? Is it about moving away from what we currently have? I guess, how do you see? I this? think there are, uh, uh, there is some work that I've also seen in uh, areas of like urban planning and uh, yeah, urban planning specifically where people are actually urban planners are engaging with these ideas of post growth. I mean, I can, I'm, I'm happy to share this one dissertation that I was reading recently, where an urban planner in Amsterdam, he has done that his thesis around, you know, incorporating post growth ideas in urban planning and re envisioning like how Amsterdam can be, you know, uh, planned better. So maybe those are the things that can. Yeah, and I think there's also an element of the world, you know, like the, the, the politics of the world that we live in, right? Like if we think about how, um, uh, I mean, you're talking about work that's done in Amsterdam, and there's certainly been other work that I'm familiar with coming from the Scandinavian region around like human-centered decision-making and policy-making and such. It's much more prevalent there. And so in those contexts, it seems like it might be easier to get behind some of these values. Um, in, in the US, it seems like it would be harder, no? In, in this model, which we're talking about caps on individual wealth, what is the model for for-profit companies? Is there one? That's a good question. I, I was reading this morning um, Vannevar Bush's Science, mm. the Endless Frontier, and reflecting on how much money the US has put into uh, basic sciences, but then also how much money went into taking some of those basic science advancements into products and processes that um, improve our health. Uh, on the one hand, they uh, continue decimating the environment on the other. Um, if, if this, I don't know, competitive for-profit environment didn't exist, would that basic research translate to uh, outcomes quite at the same mm. pace. What does human welfare look like? I was transported a little bit to when I was growing up. I grew up in Turkey. Um, there were no imports. Mm. We just had our local three cheeses. Mm -hmm. You could not travel abroad except once every two years. You had to go to Ankara and get permission from the foreign ministry if you want to travel more often and you have to have a really compelling reason. Um, we had rolling electricity blackouts. We had queues for butter and bread. Uh, I was happy <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> but I, I don't know how much innovation and technological advancement and um, like creativity and um, and uh, right. uh, 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 and optimism was um, prevalent in the population. Uh, being a public servant was the best thing because it ensured stability. You have a big government sector. Then everyone has a minimum maximum salary because it's the grids in the government sector. Mm -hmm. And then you've got you know, the agriculture workers and the blue collar workers, you know, you know, might make less money, but you know, that that grid wasn't that high. But then nobody really aspired too much. Either a couple of families had companies that were well connected to the government, and that family still controls 10% of Turkey's GDP 50 years later. So um, 
I don't know. I, it, it's hard to picture exactly what <laughs> what mm -hmm. what um, what what this post growth idea looks like. Um, I it resonates very much to try to decouple um, energy use and material use from growth mm -hmm. from innovation. Um, and innovating in ways that make us less and less reliant on energy and materials somehow. But there's limits to that too. I mean, um, you can, you see what state my phone is in, like I don't replace things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. And by the way, I was looking at the basic tenets of Herman Daly. One of the thing was that you said that there wouldn't be growth, we both said there wouldn't be growth, but also that the material inputs would be matched to the growth of the population. Mm -hmm. But that's still growth. In his model, there would be reproduction permits that would be distributed to women to have the replacement fertility rate. In fact, the population wouldn't grow either. Mm -hmm. um, that's where kind of the most basic no growth model comes from. I don't think I like that idea to be fighting over reproduction permits. I presume that got edited out of later versions. Um, but you can take some of these ideas to a place yeah. of a very repressive, yeah. Yeah. very dictatorial, very top-down yeah. uh, implementation that could be dystopian. Not that we have quite dystopian stuff happening right now. So I'm not doing that. We are, we are, we're doing well now. <laughs> but I mean, I'm also mapping yeah. some of that to what, my childhood and yeah. uh, trying to imagine. No, very much. And I think like. I, I grew up in a similar context where a lot of these things are also true about, you know, that there being like uh, two, two television channels, for example. And yeah, uh, we had one state channel. Yeah. Yeah, and and the second one wasn't even on all of the time. So uh, yes, all of that. So, but I think, um, and and it's interesting also to think about how, like, through different generations, we we sort of circle back to these ideas, thinking, well, that 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 was the those were the good days, and this is the mess that we've created for ourselves now. Um, I also wonder how how we would think about these ideas if we were not situated in the US right now, if we were in the global south, for example, like would 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 that make sense? And also, you know, what ideas are we kind of standing these ideas against? What is the um what are the alternatives that we're sort of embedded in that we are trying to challenge? Um, and as you're saying, maybe these ideas wouldn't have as much of an impact if we weren't in this economy um, that we are in right now. But uh, Michelle, what do you think? No, I mean, like, uh, I'm glad that you brought all of these points up. I think it's also coming from your positionality as being in the business school uh, <laughs> and working in that domain. And I feel like I want to push back a little on your, you know, your question of like, what will a profit oriented company or a model will look like in a post growth world. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like what that, is the industrial model? Or what's so innovation not, policy in, in a in a post growth? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not a post growth expert because it comes from a very like economics background. What we have tried to do in this paper is like bring some of the ideas to computing and say like there is a there is an alternative way. Maybe a better way, but there's an alternative way of doing computing and people outside computing within uh, you know economics and also other disciplines sociology anthropology have been talking about these ideas maybe there are some things that we can learn from them uh, so to answer that question uh, in a more compelling way i would have to go back to you know the <laughs> discipline of economics to read how they are defining it but i think their fundamental uh, argument is that the profit oriented model should not exist because what is happening in that model is like we consume resources and then uh, we we then through market economy, we create the, the you know, our, sorry, we produce resources and then through market economy, we create the uh, this artificial need of consumption, even when that's not required, you know, like people are moving to new iPhones 
unlike you, like you haven't moved to the newer version, but then there are people who are moved, right? Because the need is being created by all of these like techno structures and economy that you need to update yourself, you need to upgrade your devices. So I would push back that Daly's model, I mean, idea doesn't have a market economy. He's talking about trading permits on the market for reproductive rights. Yeah, yeah. So Postgre doesn't only incorporate Daly's ideas. There are many, many other ideas that it incorporates and that to not the entire idea from Daly, Daly, right? There are like certain aspects which are which might be beneficial and not problematic, as you mentioned about the reproductive permits right, that they're giving, right? So there are like certain ideas it takes from daily and not just daily, from even other scholars like Escobar from Latin America, even Gandhi from India, he talks about like more localized, uh, decentralized uh, industrialization uh, based on local economies and local skills. So there are like multiple ideas it takes from different mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting about this is to take an idea and then, like you're saying, um, uh, apply it to a particular context. What does it mean for computing? I love the idea of the solar, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like paper. It's not always on uh, <laughs> yeah. and things like that because it does and an idea challenge like us to think in new would... ways about hey, what's the business model of a coming from the business. What's the business model <laughs> of a newspaper? Well. It's not, <laughs> or an online newspaper. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, available at all times. Uh, yeah, so th th that's yeah. uh And because it is available all, all the time, like internet, right? It's available all the time. We don't, as a user, as much. exactly. Yeah. We don't value and we don't know that there are resource consumption happening behind this. Like it's running on resources, it's running on energy. So that is kind of, you know, uh, made invisible to us. Uh, because they want us to consume more of these resources. <laughs> well, everybody's still on, but yeah. so you must be still engaged at 407, so please jump in from on, online. <laughs> Sorry, Brent, you, you were about to say something. Yeah, so I, it seems like there's uh, the tension here is between individual liberties and the commons. Mm -hmm and the needs of the commons to enable all of us to exist, right? Um, so the definition of what is commons and what is owned, mm -hmm. uh, I think is maybe what you're arguing is to shift. Mm -hmm. um, so what is a commons? Is the currency system part of the commons? Is health insurance part of the commons? Is a corporation over a certain size part of the commons is the electrical utility part, you know, internet, all this stuff that we sort of, our current model is owned um, and people profit from. Mm -hmm. Maybe those should shift to um, common ownership. But then of course the question is, how do we create a commons um, uh, governance that is resilient as that question online mm -hmm. says to yeah. to corruption yeah yeah you probably read eleanor ostrom's work mm -hmm. yeah the economist that's talking about polycentricity yes. that some 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 problems can be solved at the community level mm -hmm. and then the commons like there's different conceptions so, the yes the commons yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and what are um yeah, so, so she challenged um, status quo in many ways. I, I found her very refreshing mm -hmm. <laughs> as well. She got it. She got it. No, she, did, she, yeah. did, she did. She did. She did. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. You know where to find uh, Neha and Vishal. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.